Good afternoon. Thanks for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for what you need to know about elder and dependent adult abuse. I'm Calvin Hu, Education Coordinator at FCA and your host. For four decades, FCA has been working across the Bay Area and the nation to improve the well-being of family caregivers. We offer support through consultations, classes, workshops, publications, retreats, research, and advocacy. If you'd like to learn more about us or access our online tool, FCA Care Journey, please visit caregiver.org. Today, I'd like to welcome our presenter, Nicole Fernandez. Nicole currently serves as the Training and Outreach Specialist for the Elder and Dependent Adult Protection Team, EDAPT, of San Mateo County, California. EDAPT is a collaboration between San Mateo County's Aging and Adult Services, the county's district attorney's office, county council's office, and local law enforcement. And they are tasked with preventing and also prosecuting elder and dependent adult abuse. Nicole joined EDAPT at the end of 2015 after a decade-long career with the California State Legislature, where she specialized in community relations, senior services, veterans, and also health policy. She has a BA in political science from San Jose State University. So now that you know a little bit more about our guest, I'd like to turn things over to Nicole. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are so I'm so pleased to be here, and I want to thank Calvin and the Family Caregiver Alliance for inviting me to speak on this really important topic. Um, now that you know a little bit about me, um, I hope to learn a little bit about you, and I hope that you are able to post some questions, which we will um, address towards the end of the presentation. Is that correct, Calvin? Yes, exactly. Great. Fabulous. Um, so can we move on to the next slide, please? So a little bit of warning. Um, I would like to let you guys know, I know we're, this is a nationwide organization, but um, the perspective I'm going to be taking today is actually a little bit more California-centric um, because I work in California and, so, and sort of my understanding of um, elder abuse, independent adult abuse um, comes from that California perspective. So many of the things are going to be universal across the nation, but some of the terms that you use are going to be um, California-centric. Um, and if you have any questions about how to access resources in your state, um, you can reach out to me or you can reach out to Calvin and we'll do our best to assist. Um, so let's define some of the populations that we're working with today. Um, an elder, according to California state code, which is this pretty universal in every state, is any person residing in the state of California that is over the age of 65, uh, a dependent adult or a vulnerable adult, or a person with disabilities, depending on how your state defines the term, is usually someone between 18 and 64 that has a mental or physical disability that keeps him or her from being able to do normal activities or protect himself or herself. Abuse of an elder or dependent adult um, includes, uh, includes the different types of abuse that we're going to be talking about today, which could include physical abuse, neglect, financial abuse, abandonment, isolation, abduction, or other treatment that can result in harm or pain or mental suffering, and a caretaker, which when many of you are, um, for your family members or clients, any person who has the care or custody or control of, a person who stands in a position of trust with, an elder or dependent adult. And those definitions are from the National Institutes on Health. Can we go to the next slide, please? Let's talk about the population of seniors in the United States right now, just to sort of give us a grounding, a foundation for who we're talking about today. Um, as it stands, um, according to the 2010 census, uh, 40 million Americans are over the age of 65. That's about 13% of the population. But that number is going to skyrocket in the next 30 to 40 years. Um, by 2040, 2050, it's estimated that there'll be between 80 to, 90, uh, 80 to 100 million Americans over the age of 65. Um, next slide, please. It's also important to address the population of dependent or vulnerable adults or people with disabilities in our, um, in our nation. Um, according to the 2010 census, about one in five Americans has some sort of disability, whether it be physical or intellectual or developmental. Um, there are seven million people living with intellectual disabilities in the United States according to the National Disability Navigator Resource Center. And um, in case you are not caring for someone who qualifies as a dependent adult, um, they will often have a relative, a friend, a caregiver, such as you, 
um, who will handle or assist with their affairs. Some will reside at home, some are in a ward or care facility, some are in nursing homes, some are in institutional settings. Depends on where they are comfortable and what is best for your family. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? So let's talk a little bit about the pop about um, sort of trends that we see, signs and symptoms that we see in the abuse of older and dependent adults uh, across our nation. I'm going to give you just a moment to think about this, but let's move to the next slide. When you see that term on the screen, which can actually be a bit jarring when you see it in bright red letters, such as um, elder abuse, what comes to mind when you think of that phrase? Just Obviously, we're in a webinar. We can't have a discussion about it. But just take a moment to write down maybe one or two things that you think about. Maybe it is kicking or punching or slapping. Maybe it is yelling. Maybe it is lying. Maybe it is going in and taking cash out of mom's checkbook or a uh, wallet. All of that can be considered elder abuse. And we're actually going to be talking about the different types that exist maybe beyond what you automatically go to when we address the topic of elder abuse. Um, the next slide, please. So you see a very handsome gentleman on the screen right now. Can you take a moment to see if you recognize him? Um, if you don't know who he is, he is a famous actor who passed away a few years ago. His name is Mickey Rooney, and he um, passed away about five years ago. And he is in this slide deck because he is arguably our nation's most famous victim of elder abuse, unfortunately. Um, so he had a very typical Hollywood existence. If you are old enough to know who he is, you may recognize some of his more famous movies like Breakfast at Tiffany's or National Velvet. Um, he was a very typical Hollywood playboy of his time, married eight times, um, won Oscars. Um, and he was also a victim of elder abuse in his last years. He testified in Congress about what it was like to be a victim of elder abuse, both physical and financial. And if it can happen to him, world famous actor, it can truly happen to the least among us in our, in the United States. It can happen to everybody. And as somebody who works in a county, I work in San Mateo County, California, which is typically considered a very affluent county, um, we see reports of abuse all the time, coming from every corner of our uh, population, every corner of our community, it can really truly surpass um, gender, socioeconomic background, ethnicity. It can truly happen to everybody in our community. And that's why I'm so grateful that so many of you are on today's webinar, um, because it really talks about uh, creating a network of support and making yourself aware of how we, um, it, it really creates a network of support to, uh, to um, help out the people who need it. And so it's really important, especially with involving him, for us to keep an eye out and be aware that we have to um, be aware of each other and take care of each other. Next slide, please. So from a California perspective, these are the types of elder and dependent adult or adult abuse that are recognized by the state of California as reportable. And so I just want to go over, um, and this is one of my favorite little handouts that comes from the C4A, California Association of Areas on Aging, um, and that will be made available to you if you decide to get the slides from Calvin. Um, but this is called Don't Miss the Signs, and it talks about the different types of abuse that exist um, and are recognized by California. Uh, neglect is when you cannot care for yourself, so you have a caregiver who provides care or is supposed to provide care, and they do not meet your basic needs. Um, clean water, clean food, hygienic uh, facilities or living conditions, things of that nature. Self-neglect is when you cannot care for yourself, either because of um, capacity issues or um, addiction issues, whatever the case may be, you are not in a position to care for yourself. Physical abuse is what we typically think about when we think of the word abuse. Um, it's basically any aggressive action that results in a physical mark. Um, so broken bones, bruises, black eyes, sprains, burns, cuts, welts, all of that can be considered physical abuse. 
Emotional abuse is threatening somebody's self-harm through words or name-calling. Um, it can be harassment, coercion, lying, profanity, infantilization, intimidation, coercion. Um, sexual abuse is basically any sexual act or sexually suggestive act with an elder or dependent adult that cannot um, consent or does not consent to participating in that. It can involve things like penetration, um, uh, sexually suggestive photography. It can involve touching. There are many different types of abuse that can occur sexually to an elder or dependent adult. And we'll go over some more of those signs later in the, um, in the program. And then financial abuse, which is actually one of the most um, common types of abuse that we see here in San Mateo County, which is basically misusing an elder or dependent adult's funds, investments, property, um, in a way that they do not consent to it being used, or lying to an elder or dependent adult in order to gain access to their personal information, which then gives you access to that money. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, please. This data or this data point comes from the National Center on Elder Abuse. And according to um, their, st their statistics, the most common abusers of elders and dependent adults are actually in the first two categories up there, family members and caregivers, um, which is really um, sad because those are the folks that our clients, our most vulnerable adults are typically closest to. It's the people who assist them on a daily basis. It's, it's, it's very often the providers who um, are, are there to provide care so that they can live um, a decent life or provide assistance in order for them to provide to, to live an inadequate life. Um, so that's really difficult. And we'll talk about some of the statistics and data that come along with underreporting related to um, the closeness of the perpetrator to the abuse, alleged abuse, a victim of abuse. The last 10% fall into the last two categories, scammers and thieves, um, you know, those folks who pretend to be from the IRS or from the courts or from Medicare and try to get your personal information um, in order to access your money. And then unethical financial industry representatives, um, uh, such as folks trying to sell older or dependent adults products that they don't need or understand when they purchase solar, uh, solar panel uh, annuities things that uh, the reverse mortgages, things that, they, the things that they don't understand or might not be appropriate for them under the circumstances. Let us go ahead and move to the next screen, please. This is from a startup called Truelink Financial, and they actually provide, um, uh, they provide debit card protection for folks who are older or dependent adults. Um, and this is from a financial abuse study that they released a few years ago. And it is estimated that seniors, people over 65, lose about $36.5 billion every year to financial abuse and exploitation. Um, and it's kind of a, sort of on the higher end. It's really hard to pin down a number. There have been some studies that said it was as low as 2.5 billion, but the more recent data sets that have come out have actually, have actually put the numbers higher. Um, so I tend to go with this number um, because it's sort of what we are seeing reflected in San Mateo County, which are high dollar losses for elder and dependent adults who have been financially exploited. And it is very common here in San Mateo County, um, we're just south of San Francisco, where we see a lot of um, financial abuse and exploitation related to uh, property loss and uh, title uh, uh, and and things related to titles uh, of home of home ownership. Um, so you'll see about 17 billion dollars is lost to exploitation, about 13 billion is lost to fraud, and about 7 billion is lost to trust abuse, um, which is when a family friend or paid helper takes advantage of a relationship in order to get money from a senior. Um, we tend to think that that number, that 7 billion, is very underreported um, because, as we know. The most common abusers are very close to the alleged abuse victim. And so underreporting happens all the time. We're actually going to get into that a little bit to talk about why is abuse so underreported. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please? Here are some consequences of abuse. Just to think about um, if you have been a victim of abuse in the past, um, what are sort of the outcomes? What are, what are some of the effects of having been in that position? Um, uh, so, 
studies show that abuse victims, um, especially older adult victims, uh, tend to socialize less. They tend to be diagnosed with depression or suffer from self-neglect where they can't care for themselves anymore. They might feel exceptional guilt at having an abuser, um, a caregiver slash abuser um, being prosecuted for having taken advantage of them. Maybe low self-esteem at having been a victim. Physical injury if the abuse was physical or in some cases death. As we know, some older adults are more um, are not as uh, able to bounce back as they used to. And we do see some of these injuries going, leading towards death sometimes. Um, can we move to the next um, slide, please? Uh, this is a statistic that I found recently from the CDC. And it is important to sort of understand the scope of the problem. Elder abuse, including neglect and exploitation, is experienced by one out of every 10 people ages 60 and older who live at home. So it, is, it does very frequently occur to folks who are based in the community. Very often we think about older adults being abused or neglected or isolated in facilities. Um, just very often our mind jumps to that. But very frequently the folks who are being exploited or abused are actually living at home, um, living in where they're comfortable, living where um, they feel safe. And unfortunately that's just not the outcome. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? It's also impo important to note, um, and this is another statistic from a, the New York Elder Abuse Prevalence Study, but we're going to talk a little bit about why underreporting happens so frequently. But for every one case of elder abuse reported to the authorities, it is estimated that another 24 go unreported. Um, so it is extreme, this crime is extremely underreported. Very often the alleged victim does not want to participate in an investigation or talk to Adult Protective Services, my colleagues here in San Mateo County. Um, and there are a number of reasons why, starting with uh, going back to that data point we had a couple of slides ago, which is that very frequently the abuser is someone who is close to the victim. Um, it is a child, it's an in-law, it's a friend. Um, it is someone who is in a great position of trust with that person, and so why would you want to turn them in? Because you have great emotion, great affection, great sense of responsibility towards them. And let's go into some other reasons why it might be more um, underreported. Can we go to the next slide, please? So these are all these are all from an or um, OHSU, Oregon Health State University, um, a study that they um, put out called A Cross-Cultural Approach to Elder Abuse and Neglect. So I just wanted to give credit to where some of these data points are coming from. But some other reasons why an older adult may not, or a dependent adult may not want to um, come out as a victim, self-report, participate in investigation. Um, they, they, uh, they're experiencing embarrassment um, at having been victimized. Um, they fear losing their independence. If they are an alleged victim, they fear that they are going to be moved into a licensed facility and have to give up um, their self-determination and independence and choice in where they live. Um, maybe the suspect is someone that they love, that someone they raised, someone they rely on in order to, con to complete their um, actions of daily living. Um, maybe they fear retaliation from an abuser. Maybe they fear that someone who's turned into the police might get out um, and come back for revenge. Um, maybe they lack mental capacity, and especially with when we're dealing with vulnerable or dependent adults. Maybe they do not have the ability to understand that they are being abused um, or to even understand that they can report to somebody. There's denial. Denial is not just a river in Egypt, as my grandfather says. Um, it, is, uh, it is very easy to um, convince yourself that what is going on is normal. And that goes in hand in hand with the next bullet point, considering abusive, abuse normal behavior. If you come from a culture or a family where abusive behavior is how you work, how you operate, it's normal. You don't know any different. Um, maybe there's an inability to communicate the abuse. Maybe you um, are, maybe you've had a stroke and you've lost your ability to talk. Um, maybe you are mute and can't speak. Maybe there's a language barrier. You never know. 
And then maybe you come from a home or a family or a culture where you believe in keeping things behind closed doors. Our business is our business and we don't talk to outsiders about that, even if it is really bad. Even if you are being exploited, we keep our business our business. That happens very frequently. We see that all the time here in San Mateo County. Um, next slide, please. It's also important to note that there are some specific things to consider about underreporting for um, elders who come from minority or communities of color. Um, coming back to language barriers or lack of interpretation services, someone may not want to participate or help the authorities in an investigation or report themselves um, because there's no one on the team that speaks their language or there are no interpretation services, services available. As we know, especially with government and nonprofits, funds are limited um, for things like this and for things like this. And so a simple lack of a translator can make a world of difference. Um, isolation in some cultures, once you reach a certain age, seven, uh, in, once you reach the later decades of your life, um, you are sort of put out to pasture in a way um, where you do not interact with the family very much and you're sort of left to your own devices. So you might not have access to, some, access to someone such as an authority figure or even a family member who can help you out of that situation. Immigration status. Maybe you're undocumented. Maybe your family members are undocumented. Maybe your uh, alleged abuser who is a um, family member is undocumented and you don't want to get the authorities involved for, being, for fear of being deported or getting involved in the um, immigration, in uh, getting involved in immigration. A fear of law enforcement. Maybe you come from a community or maybe you come from another country where law enforcement is feared or corrupt in some cases. Um, there are some countries where you have to bribe um, police in order to help you and you may not have the funds. Um, so simple things like that. Maybe you have an unfamiliarity with the, how we work here in the United States. Um, uh, the court system, adult protective services, government agencies in general, service, uh, even nonprofits. Maybe you don't know that there are resources out there to help. Um, maybe you come from a culture where there is community pressure to remain with your abuser. Um, to stay with your family, to keep your business your business. And maybe there's a history of trauma where you can't even verbalize what's happening to you. Maybe there's something that's happened in your background, flashbacks, PTSD, PTSD social anxiety, that cannot, that stops you from talking to someone about this, including an investigator or law enforcement. Um, there are many reasons why someone might not want to participate or report. Can we go to the next slide, please? There are also some other reasons just physically um, as we age, things change in our brains. And I think it's important to note that some older adults might be more vulnerable to abuse because of that, what happens with, to our brains as we, change, as we age and change. Um, our judgment may be compromised. Um, older adults are more prone to loneliness and depression and isolation. Um, and very often, um, if you are going to be diagnosed, if, if, if you are sort of on that road, that fine road to dementia, financial capacity is the first um, capacity to diminish. And so it is important to note that if someone is having a challenging time with, um, if they're having a, a difficult time with um, finances, that might be a sign that they need to be checked out with their doctor. They can have a complete normal conversation with you about politics, about family, about vacations, um, but they can't understand how to add up their checkbook. They don't understand the value of high dollar items that they have in the home. They can't add up money. Um, they don't have a concept of numbers. So if you see that happening, that might be a sign that they need to be assessed by their doctor. Okay, can we move to the next um, slide, please? So there are some other things to take into consideration about sort of why abuse occurs. Um, family stressors are a big one. Um, and this is a quote, um, this, all of this information comes from a great little booklet that the American Psychological Association puts out called Elder Abuse and Neglect in Search of Solutions. But this quote kind of sums up where I sort of see things. Um, with older adult abuse. So William Stieg is a famous author. Um, he wrote a number of amazing children's books. 
And he said, I've always despised old people. I got angry at my father when he began to show signs of age. And that happens to a lot of us who are put in a position where we have to care for an older um, family member or a dependent family member. There can be stress and um, uh, bitterness and lack of resources. And all of that can add up to why abuse might occur in a family situation. Um, can we move on to the next slide? So going back to what we were talking about before, you may come from a family with a history of, uh, a history of violence where maybe violence is normalized, um, maybe violence in different contexts, such as domestic violence between two partners or marital violence, um, or even violence among family members, uh, mother to child, um, uh, parent to child, or between siblings. It happens very frequently. And that can really scar and also sort of project how you see the world and how you view, how you may normalize or view violence in general. Uh, the next, uh, the next slide, please. Uh, another thing to consider is inter intergenerational violence. Um, we there are trends where someone may have been abused by a parent growing up. And then they are put into a situation where they have to care for a vulnerable parent as that parent has aged. And so you take your power back and maybe you take revenge by being abusive towards your older parent. We've seen it multiple times here at Adult Protective Services here in San, in San Mateo County. Um, another uh, another uh, slide, please. Um, other family stressors. We live here in San Mateo County. We live in an extremely um, housing is at a housing is a com major commodity here in San Mateo County. Um, the average cost of a home here in San Mateo County is about 1.7 million dollars. It is really hard to find affordable living quarters here in San Mateo County, and so many families are forced to double and triple up in small one-family homes, where living in close quarters can create stress that might results in elder or dependent adult abuse and you can't um you also we also have to give the context that caregivers as you all know um there is a lot of financial stress that comes from paying for caregiving and also a lot of sacrifices that be, that need to be made you may need you may need to take time off or get your wages cut to take in a parent to uh the doctor or you may need to give up working altogether and also, not every family member is going to pitch in to care, in, to care for an older family member um, or someone who needs caregiving. So there's a lot of stress that happens within families as a result of being a caregiver. And that's why it's really great that the Family Caregiver Alliance is there to help. And so if, you, if any of this sounds familiar to you, please reach out to the 800 number at the Family Caregiver Alliance because they have a lot of resources available for folks who are in that position. And is there better to prevent this the, before Adult Protective Services is called? Uh, can we uh, move to the next slide, please? Um, there are a lot of caregiving stresses, as you know, that come from uh, caring for an older or dependent adult. Um, maybe the caregiver has their own issues that they bring in towards their caregiving responsibilities. Uh, maybe they are, maybe there are mental health conditions that might be exacerbated when uh, pressure is put on to care for an older adult. Maybe there are addictions involved, substance abuse or gambling. Um, maybe there's a reliance on the older adult for money or shelter. Um, and you need, and, and someone needs access to that older adult's money in order to continue with those to continue with those um, uh, habits. And there might be a tendency towards violence, as we were talking about before. We all bring different experiences to our caregiving abilities. Um, and so perhaps there is um, a, a maybe violence. You come from a household where violence was normalized. And so those are just things to consider and things that we see. Um, next slide, please. Um, other caregiver issues that might come up that might result in abuse, um, lacking training to provide care. Maybe you're sort of put in a position where um, the family's decided you are the person that's going to care for the older or dependent adult in your life and don't provide any training or support. And there's a lot that can come out from that. There's no respite. Um, 
not everybody pitches in. So you are the person who's doing all of this solo and that can create a lot of bad, um, that can create a lot of bad momentum. And then maybe dutiful child, maybe you feel like you have to care for an older adult um, or a dependent adult, um, even at the expense of your own mental health because your parents took such good care of you, so you want to take good care of them. And if you are spread too thin, if there's too much going on, if there aren't enough resources out there, sometimes that can result in neglectful or abusive behavior. Um, can we move forward, please? Next slide, please. Hello? Hi, can you see the yes. cultural issues uh, slide? Okay, I can see it right now. Thank you. Um, let us move forward with uh, some of the cultural issues that we might see. Um, we talked a little bit more about this earlier, but we uh, spoke about families that believe that what happens behind closed doors stays behind closed doors. So we keep our secrets to ourselves and we keep our difficulties to ourselves and we do not reach out to others. And that create tension and stress that might result in abuse. And in some cultures um, and in some communities, there might be the undervaluing the role of elders and women, um, where once you re reach a certain age or if you are of a particular gender, you aren't cared for at all, um, especially when you need that care. And so that might result in uh, neglectful behavior. Uh, let us move on to the next slide, please. So here are some potential indicators of abuse to look for in an older adult loved ones or clients. Um, if the elder adult has, appears uncared for or has poor personal hygiene where they used to present very cleanly, um, they used to have clean clothes and hair brushed and suddenly they're showing up and they smell like urine and they have, in, they have stains on their clothes and you're not quite sure what's going on. Um, if they have, if the client has or the loved one has unexplained bruising, sores or burns and can't explain how they got it, doesn't want to talk about how they got it, might, there might be a sense of trauma associated with having those um, physical marks. Uh, next slide, please. And actually, uh, these are some really great things that you, you can download from the National Center on Elder Abuse. And these actually talk about where accidental bruising might happen in older adults versus where intentional bruising as a result of physical harm may occur. And um, I'm not going to go over this. In, uh, in detail, but you can actually download these at the National Center on Elder Abuse website, which is one of the links that will be uh, available to you at the end of the slide, slide deck. So why don't we skip forward on this slide and skip forward to the next slide. But if this topic interests you, you can go ahead and download those slides. Um, if the, elder, the older adult is depressed, confused, afraid, agitated, or anxious, um, especially if they're agitated or anxious in the presence of a certain household member or caregiver, or if they get very emotional in the presence of a caregiver or fearful, if they start crying, if they start shaking, especially when someone comes into the room, that might be a sign that there's something going on. Um, if an elder has a child or caregiver that is dependent on the senior for shelter or money, that might be a sign that there might be some financial abuse on the horizon. If an elder has changes in appetite or weight loss or dramatic weight loss or gain not related to an ongoing illness, that might be a sign that there's something going on. If the older adult has, um, if they're not able to do the things they used to do in order to maintain their independence, such as shop, make meals, or get around. If, uh, with regard to financial abuse, they have unusual activity in their bank accounts. If they're giving money away or not understanding the value of high dollar items that they have, if they are, have unpaid bills or can't buy food or the other basic necessities that they need. Um, if they suddenly have statements going to new addresses and don't know where their social security check is going at the end of the month, like they can't track where the money's going, that might be a sign that there's something going on. If the elder is isolated or someone is isolating them, stopping them from enjoying the social occasions that they usually um, enjoy, such as going to church or having visitors, making phone calls, that might be a sign that there's something going on. As you may know, there is proven correlation between um, isolated individuals and the likelihood that abuse might occur because there's no third party or sort of a check and balance system. Um, if the elder has untreated chronic illness, um, if someone who is a caregiver is not providing the basic needs that they need, 
such as providing wound care, taking them to the doctor, helping them um, refill medication. All of that can be considered neglectful behavior. If the elder has relatives, friends, or professionals coming out of the woodwork um, who initiate suspicious or quiet conversations about finances, um, if they say, don't trust, don't trust anybody in the family but me, I'm the only person who can care for you um, and your money, don't trust anybody else but me, that might be a sign that there is the potential for something happening on the horizon. Um, so those are sort of the signs to look for in older adult clients. Um, let us move on to looking into what might happen with um, dependent people with disabilities, dependent adults, as we term them here in, in California. Um, but let's look at this. Um, let's look at the statistic from the 2012 National Survey on Abuse of People with Disabilities. Over 70% of people with disabilities reported that they had been a victim of abuse, and more than 63 percent of parents and immediate family members reported that their loved ones um, their loved ones with disabilities had experienced abuse. Those numbers are astronomical. So 70 percent of people with disabilities. Um, so let's move forward. So here are some signs to look for uh, with uh, of indicators of abuse to look for in individuals who are um, are vulnerable or dependent or intellectually disabled, how, whatever term you're using. Um, and these all come from the Florida Agency for Persons with Disabilities. And it's a pretty good list. Um, so if there's bruising, old and new, clustered on one part of the body, um, on both upper arms, burns, cuts or scars, marks left by a gag, imprint in injuries, especially ones that look like fingers or thumbs or belts or sticks or missing teeth. Um, other indicate, indicators, maybe spotty balding from pulled hair, um, such as if an, a person with intellectual disabilities is frustrated and pulling out their own hair or someone else has done that. Eye injuries, broken bones, sprains, abrasions, vaginal or rectal pain, bleeding from the ears, nose or mouth, or frequent urinary tract infections or yeast infections. Um, some more to look for, painful urination, abrasion, incontinence in someone who was previously toilet trained, frequent sore throats, sudden onset of psychosomatic complaints, or sudden difficulty walking or sleeping. Okay, another, and, 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 um, and then let's look at some of the behavioral, the behavioral changes that might happen in somebody uh, with intellectual disabilities who is being who who is potentially being abused. Changes in the way affection is shown, sudden fear of being touched, sudden onset of nightmares, major changes in sleep patterns such as difficulty sleeping, and sudden regression to childlike behavior such as bedwetting or thumb sucking. Um, some other potential indicators of abuse uh, to look for in intellectually disabled clients, behavioral. Um, sudden unusual interest or knowledge of sexual matters, cruelty to animals, sudden fear of bathing or toileting, uh, sudden fear of a person or a place, and depression or mood swings. Um, so those are the sort of, those are the things to look for um, in if you are caring for a person who is a vulnerable adult or a dependent adult or a person with intellectual disability. So let's look at some of the tips that we can do, we can take to protect the person we love uh, who might be an older adult or a disabled adult. Um, investigate any financial offers that come your client or loved one's way. If someone asks them to invest in a, in, to make an investment, um, if they ask them to buy a service, um, if they ask them to um, buy a product, make sure you do your research and make sure that it's a good use of their money. Um, you can always go to the Better Business Bureau, the Chamber of Commerce, um, make sure that they are, make sure that you do your research to make sure that the person who's doing the selling towards you is uh, is licensed and in a good standing with the agency that licenses them. Know that there's no such thing as a free lunch. If there's a salesperson who's trying to get you to uh, come listen to a sales pitch and they want to buy you a free lunch to make you, to, to kind of compel you to make that purchase, don't do it. Um, they, the product should sell itself. You shouldn't need a free meal in order to part with your money. Don't explore alone. If, you're, if your family member or client um, maybe is making friends over the internet and wants to meet them in real life, 
make sure that they take somebody with them, make sure you know where they're going, make sure that you have contact information. Don't be afraid to Google the person that they're meeting, make sure that you don't Google their name, see if anything comes up, just do your due diligence. Don't give out important numbers over the phone, especially in the case of phone scammers. And don't believe anybody who says that they're calling from a government agency because government agencies very often aren't going to call you directly. They're going to send somebody to your house in the case of law enforcement or social services, or they're going to send you a letter in which you'll need to follow up. And then uh, let's go to the next slide, please, Calvin. Um, and again, it looks like the slides are stuck. I'm really sorry about that. Um, but let's continue on. Um, if you are going to be hiring in-home caregivers for respite, um, in case you aren't providing the day-to-day -day, the day-to-day the, the -day duties as a caregiver, make sure you go to a reputable agency that insures their folks, trains their folks, provides insurance for their folks, and um, so they know what their responsibilities are. Um, don't pick up the phone unless you know who's on the other side. Use that caller ID. It was invented for a reason. Unfortunately, scammers are getting more sophisticated as we get, as, uh, the longer we get, so they can change the name that appears on the caller ID. But if you don't understand, if you don't recognize it at all, let it go to voicemail. And don't answer the door to folks you don't know. Um, the only time I ever answer my door uh, to folks I don't know is cook during Girl Scout cookie season because thin mints are the best. But as a general rule, I don't answer the door to folks that I don't know or don't expect. Um, let us move to the next slide. So let's talk about if you suspect that something's happening with a loved one or a friend and you want to make a report, what do you do? Um, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. I just want to remind everybody that this presentation is very California-centric because I do come from California, but I did my best to make this sort of universal. Um, but I hope that uh, this information is, is useful to everybody who's uh, watching today. Uh, let's move to the next slide, please. So let's talk about who investigates when you um, when you make a phone call. So every state in our nation has something called Adult Protective Services. And you can find the phone number for your local Adult Protective Services by Googling your state number and Adult Protective Services. And you can call them and speak to a social worker and talk about the situation you're encountering. Um, all calls that go into them are confidential and you, should, you can definitely call them if you have questions. Um, in California, we actually parse out our adult protective services by county. So every county, we have about 58 counties in California, and each of those counties has an adult protective services, but it doesn't matter. Just Google your location and adult protective services. But APS in California, at least, is a county-based program or a state-based program um, that intervenes to remedy or reduce dangers to elder or dependent adults. Um, so we're basically social workers who go out and investigate those who are at risk of neglect, self-neglect, or abuse. Um, we develop relationships. We work in partnership with law enforcement, district attorney's offices, whoever our partners are, in order to investigate the allegations. And our goal is to maintain the health and safety of the elder independent or dependent adult in the community. So we want to keep them at home if we can with the assistance that we can provide using the services that are, the services that are available to us. Um, but some of the challenges that we face as adult protective services workers. We're voluntary. So a client can refuse to cooperate with us at any time. Um, they have to want to change their situation. They have to want to talk to us. And so if we visit in, if we visit an alleged victim of abuse and they say that they don't want to talk to us or they don't open the door or if they actively avoid us, um, we have to accommodate that request and basically close the case, unfortunately. In California, at least, if a penal code section has been violated, we may bring in police to take the lead on the investigation because police can compel um, action more than we can as APS workers. Um, if a client lacks capacity to give consent, we may start conservatorship, we may um, initiate conservatorship proceedings. And again, our goal is to respect self-determination to the greatest extent possible. So you may ask, um, what happens when I call Adult Protective Services? So I just wanted to walk you through sort of a little infographic that talks about what happens behind the curtain on our end of things when you make that phone call. This comes from the administration on aging. Um, if you look at the first box, it says APS will receive and report a suspected abuse. And then second box, the APS staff screens the case to determine whether it meets eligibility criteria. 
that the case cannot be opened by APS because it doesn't meet our standards for a case. We may look at some of our nonprofit and service provider partners to see what services can be provided to that person. If the APS case can be opened, then we're going to assign that to a caseworker for investigation. The caseworker will then do their best to make contact with the older or dependent adults at their home, unscheduled, um, to assess immediate risk, investigate abuse, and determine if abuse can be substantiated. If you look at the FIS box, APS is then going to in provide or arrange for a variety of services to ensure that the older adult's immediate safety and well-being is okay. We're going to look at some of the service we, services we can provide, including medical care, emergency placement, food delivery, attendance care. And if there is obvious abuse that has been um, involving criminal activity, we're going to work in partnership with our prosecutor's office to make sure that alleged abuser is held accountable for their actions. And then we're going to... Um, continue the investigation, and at some point we're going to conclude the investigation, but continue services for a limited amount of time to make sure that the victim is doing well and that their well-being is doing okay. In California, at least, we, all, we also have a parallel organization called the Ombudsman's Office, and they are uh, the long-term care ombudsman. Your state may also have something similar, but Adult Protective Services addresses abuse uh, allegations to older and dependent adults that live in the community, in their homes. Um, but the Ombudsman's Office actually investigates abuse allegations in licensed long-term care facilities here in California. Um, they investigate to resolve complaints um, made by individual residents. Um, they also investigate complaints regarding uh, nursing homes, residential care facilities, and those that, is, that, assist, that are assisted living facilities. And they're going to look at issues regarding um, uh, elder abuse complaints and uh, uh, other issues that uh, that face those folks who live in those in those licensed long-term care facilities. Um, another option for who might investigate is law enforcement. If it is um, if an immediate crime has occurred, um, if there's somebody, if physical, if there's anybody in immediate physical danger or something or an obvious crime has occurred, then uh, law enforcement will be the first ones in, and they will we will all, they will also often work in partnership with Adult Protective Services or the Ombudsman's Office in order to um, in order to uh, resolve the issue and to address the comment from Tom Cappell. LTPO stands for Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program, and that's in California. Uh, let us go to the, and if you need to find the local phone number for either of those programs, such as law enforcement or ombudsman, you can Google your state name with ombudsman or Google your state name with police or law enforcement. So we're going to conclude with just letting you know that there are lots of options out there if you suspect that someone you love or you care for is being abused or neglected. Um, there are at least three different agencies, at least in California, that would pick up the, that will investigate. You don't have to be 100% sure, but it is important that if you suspect something is happening, that you do reach out to the appropriate authorities. Um, you are, you, uh, calls that come in are, are confidential. Um, and it's important to sort of assess and consult with someone who knows about how to investigate these allegations of abuse. So you can always call us, um, run a scenario by us, use us as a sounding board, and we're always happy to give you advice, recommendations, refer you to community agencies that can assist you, and just know that there is help out there and, um, and, and take advantage of it, use it. Um, being a caregiver is one of the hardest jobs in the world. And so please use that support where we can. And thank you for being part of the village and the network that keeps our older adults and dependent adults safe. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn this back over to Calvin. And this is my contact information right here on this last slide. So thanks so much for your time. And if there are any questions, let me know. Perfect. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, it looks like we have about six minutes for questions. Uh, Nicole did mention she would be willing to stay a little bit after if we go a little bit over for questions, but we'll try and end right on time. I guess the first question would be in terms of, I guess you alluded to it a little bit in the previous slide, but when would be the most appropriate situation to call APS, uh, Adult Protective Services, versus dialing 911? Right. So if anybody's in immediate physical danger, if there's an obvious crime that has occurred, if there is um, 
if, if a life is on the line, call an emergency call, please. Um, if it is something, because um, with Adult Protective Services in California, at least you have 10 days, we've, we, are not, we are not first responders. We are not, um, we're investigators, but we are not first responders. So if there's something that there's an immediate need, if there's immediate danger, if you need a welfare check immediately, call the police. But for Adult Protective Services and the Ombudsman, we usually have 10 days in which we can, we, we can make it out there in order to start an investigation. So obviously, we are not getting out there immediately if someone's in specific danger. So please call the police if there's an immediate, uh, the immediate potential of risk or harm to an older or dependent adult. Sure. And then uh, just a, a bit of a follow-up question. If, say, someone uh, thought there was maybe a, a grave threat to life and, and well-being and they wanted to really make sure and wanted the police to, to stop by, so called called 911, but it turned out that wasn't exactly the case and, and things maybe weren't as dire, but that they, there was still maybe a case for Adult Protective Services to investigate. Would the police in general contact Adult Protective Services on their own? Absolutely. Or is that something? Okay. Yes. So we cross report to each other all the time. And if they have, if they're dealing with clients who are over the age of 65 or have a vulnerability, um, we, we talk to each other constantly. We exchange paperwork constantly, but it doesn't, it, it always, it does not hurt to call both agencies or all agencies just to make sure you're covering yourself. Okay, perfect. And then uh, you kind of alluded to this is one of a, a question I, I got a little bit earlier and you alluded to it a little bit before in terms of who the main who many it seems are uh, people uh, are the abusers, but in a situation where it might be two siblings and one sibling is suspecting the other of abuse, but they are a little bit hesitant to call APS because of obvious their siblings and their it's you know their own family members and they don't necessarily want to get you know outsiders involved. What advice might you have in terms of whether it's it's the right thing to do or how they should think about um, getting APS involved? So I don't think you should ever have any fear about calling adult protective services because I would say a good number of our cases, at least here in San Mateo County, are siblings quarreling with each other about money or the care of a parent. Um, it happens very frequently, but there are lots of resources out there. If, if it's an abusive situation, if an older adult is being neglected, please call the police, please call adult protective services. But if you're just irritated at the way that a parent, that a child, is, your sibling is caring for your parent, or worried about your inheritance, there are other ways to approach it that don't involve law enforcement or social services. Um, you can go to family mediation. Um, you can get an attorney involved. Um, but there are lots of options out there for you. Okay. And you can also you can all and yeah, and you can always call your area agency on aging, uh, which is your location plus area agency on aging, and they can ha they will have some resources out there with regard to family mediation and um, options for you to talk to facilitate a conversation between quarreling siblings. Sure. And then again, in terms of if they were to contact APS, it's not it's not as if every APS um, report ends up ends up becoming an investigation. It, it's um, well, they they would investigate, but they're they're not essentially going to always be found, always going to find cases of abuse. They're going to look into it and, and determine whether there was abuse or not. Is that correct? Absolutely. So not every report that we get is opened up, and not every report that we get is substantiated. Um, uh, but making that phone call to just even start the dialogue is a good thing. Sure. So really, APS they're just looking for looking out for the best interest of the 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 elder in question. They're not looking to yes. to cause trouble or to cause strife within families. They're really trying to work with everyone. Not at all. Okay. Not at all. We're just trying to make make sure that the well the welfare of the older or dependent adult is uh, paramount, and doing our best to inform them. Sure. To the best of our ability. Here's um another question, which is um a good one in terms of one of um. Many of our, our clients are caregivers of someone with dementia. What would happen with a report of a senior who has memory problems but also lives alone? Well, there are uh, there are lots of resources out there, um, especially from the Alzheimer's uh, Alzheimer's Association, and I know from Care Family Caregiver Alliance. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I can't speak specifically to that um, at some point. An older adult should not be living alone if they have, um, but that's easier said than done. But there are resources and partnerships out there for folks who need assistance and who need help caring for someone with uh, with dementia or some other cognitive issues. 
Okay, perfect. And then in terms of APS, you mentioned, I guess, at least in California, it's um, an adult 65 or older. Um, um, yeah. Right? What, what would be the situation, um, a hypothetical, what, what would happen if it was someone who there's maybe uh, suspicions of abuse, but they're like 64 and a half? Do they have, is there any kind of... Yeah. Um, yeah so we're, 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 we're a little flexible on either side. Um, so if the person is, if, if the person, we, we usually, the hard and fast rule is 65, but if we can sort of round up to meet 65, we, we will sometimes consider opening a case, um, such as 60, you know, 62, 63. Um, but that's that if circum, but that the circumstances are grave enough to open, a, to open up, uh, open up a case. Um, in some cases we, we need to get it out of, uh, aging and adult services or adult protective services and refer to one of our partner organizations, uh, such as if the client has mental health issues, we'd work, we'd work with our behavioral health uh, colleagues and, and see and help them get the assistance that they need. Okay. And um, I have another question about a, uh, a, a, again, another family, a kind of family issue there. There was an allegation, I guess, of abuse in the past. And they're looking to actually prosecute or bring, you know, bring kind of a criminal, uh, criminal charge against uh, a relative. Would um, would they call APS for that, or how how would that work if they really want to? If yeah. they really think there's something kind of rather untowards, and they really want it, want the um, the courts to be able to figure it out for them. If you see something, say something. It's better to over-report than under-report. Um, and with adult protective services, it's important to note that we cannot assist with a victim who is deceased. The, okay. the victim has to be, the, the, the victim has to be alive. And so while you have that time, especially if the, the alleged victim is someone who is older, it's really important to see. Um, it's really important to note that, um, uh, that they should call sooner rather than later. Um, but yes, of course you can call adult protective services about something like that. And they can, and APS can very frequently and does very frequently work with the district attorney's office in order to prosecute alleged abusers. And so we can be your, your sort of your entry point into that legal justice system or refer you to, um, uh, legal partners who can help you get the justice that you seek on behalf of your relative. Okay. I think, let's see, we're right at two past the hour. I think we have time for two more quick questions. The first one is, and you mentioned some of the signs of abuse for someone, for more of an, a, a dependent adult, someone who might not have the capacity, uh, the same capacity as, as everybody else. So in, in, in that um, sense, what might be some of the signs for someone who has or is living with dementia in terms of signs of abuse? Would they be um, similar to the ones you mentioned in terms of uh, the dependent adult uh, sites? Very, very similar. Uh, aggregate, uh, very similar. Aggravation, a, a lot of the same limitations that exist in individuals with uh, intellectual disabilities very often cross over to folks with dementia. Um, so I would go over the list that I provided in the slides. Okay, perfect. And then just as a, a reminder, I've, I know I've gotten questions for that and um, Nicole has also mentioned. I'll make sure to get a copy of the slides to anyone who registered for the webinar. I'll send out a link where you can download the slides so you have them uh, all in one place and also a recording of the webinar. That'll come out in probably about a week. And then finally, uh, this question is, I hopefully this will be kind of uh, in, in your wheelhouse, but we had a, a caregiver who wanted to know they're maybe a little bit worried about not not crossing that maybe fine line in terms of it's probably more of of a financial elder abuse, but you know not not wanting to get in that situation where is it is it you know is it I'm getting paid for my caregiving i you know the my staying at my mom's house or my uncle's house is is them helping me out is is their way to help me out so I can provide this care. Is there a way for them to kind of think about not not crossing that line from uh, maybe kind of a mutual beneficial relationship to maybe more Absolutely. of an abusive one? Yeah. Um, honestly, the best way to deal that the best way to deal with that, the best way to prevent something like that from happening, um, and basically just sort of put everything above ground is to have something in writing. It may be awkward to have some sort of written contract between a parent and the child or whoever the caregiver is. 
Um, but having something written that talks about the services you provide, the compensation you receive, whether it's free rent or helping them out, whatever the case is, but having it in writing can actually really, really help. So having a contract drawn up, um, which there are many templates out there, um, and uh, is, is definitely something I would encourage folks to, to do. Perfect. Thanks so much. Well, I think that is all the time we have. Thanks again for staying a little bit later uh, later with us today. I just wanted to mention that the webinar, actually, Nicole participated with us in a previous webinar specifically on elder and financial, uh, on elder scams, actually, financial abuse that you can find on our website, which is a great resource if you wanted to get a little bit more in depth on some of the common scams that uh, these uh, people use to target older, older adults. But anyways, I'd like to thank you all for participating in today's webinar, which was presented by Nicole Fernandez. Uh, FCA webinars are a free and continuing series. You can find more information about our next one on our website. Thanks again, Nicole, for joining us today. Thank you very much. The webinar is now concluded, and we hope to see you all for the next one. I wish you all a great afternoon.